What up, Wizards? It's Dev and Digby. He's down here, too. We're from SBMTG. Just a couple of boys. We like it on magic. And today, we're going to do my favorite kind of video. We only get to do it a few times a year, too. You know, spoiler season is always super hype. And it feels like each one is more hype than the last one, right? And we look through every nook and cranny when we analyze these cards. And we do a lot of talking about new stuff, right? It seems like every video I did for preview season this year was like an hour or more. <laughs> it was like that for like every content creator too. It wasn't just me. So we are always looking for new ways and new lenses through which to analyze these new cards and make content for you. But same time, it feels like there's still a ton of cards every preview season that fall through the cracks. However, conversely, and yeah, Ziggy's here now. Uh, there are also a bunch of cards that come out every single set that see a ton of standard play and we're like, man, I never saw them coming. Q Persona 5 music here. Well, don't actually do it, Ziggy, because then I'll probably get a copyright strike, right? So just Persona 5 reference here. But anyway, dear viewer, you have met at the convergence of those two ideas here, right? Like, what have we not paid enough attention to during spoiler season and will ultimately break out once we actually get to play with these stinking cards? Today, the top 10 sleepers in Strixhaven. And I'm your favorite magic channel, favorite magic channel. Best believe that the professor go bananas for my deck text. I come correct like a porn star slicing up all these other suckers with my sword mark. But let's start with the honorable mention and I have no that's not even an accent that people have in the real world. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that, but let's start let's start with the honorable mention. <laughs> and this time around, it's practical research. I cannot get my mind off this card, but I still don't think that it's like a very good card, which is why. It's uh, that's, that's the kind of card that's traditionally in the, the honorable mentions of the sleeper video. Card that will almost certainly not see play, but Dev likes. And that's pretty much where practical research lands. I mean, this draws four cards at instant speed. And so I like it. It costs a lot of mana, but maybe a discard, a glimpse of freedom or something like that. And you have something to escape out of your graveyard. There's a ton of instants and sorceries with escape. Just dump them in the yard, instant speed, draw whatever you need. It's pretty good. Draw four is crazy. <laughs> I know you only get to really keep three, right? And note that it's just like a thirst. A thirst for meaning or a thirst for knowledge or whatever, right? You draw the cards and then you can discard a card. So you get four shots at drawing a thing to discard. You still get a huge jump in card advantage, a massive refill, probably whatever you actually needed, even if you have to discard two. Still not that big of a deal. I've had instant speed. I kind of like this package, but I'm not really sure it goes anywhere. In other words, yeah, drawing four at instant speed is really good, but I'm still not sure it's quite practical. I, I did it. I didn't. I told myself I wasn't going to make the joke, and I made the joke. I'm sorry. But let's go ahead and actually start the list here with number 10, a card that people are talking about, but I really don't think they're taking seriously enough, and that's Strix Haven Stadium. Now, first thing I want to say about this card, I don't actually like it very much in the aggro decks that everybody seems to want to play it in. I've had a couple of people ask me the totally fair and understandable question. If this is a decent sideboard card for aggro decks against the mono white life gain matchup, right? Because it's a way to win the game out of your board without really having to care about your opponent's life total. And that's kind of nice, but honestly, I just wouldn't play this in any hardline aggro deck. That's just looking to deal 20 as quickly as possible because it soaks up your turn three or some other turn without really affecting the board state. And aggro just don't have the time for that, honestly. So I don't like it as much in aggro. But where I do like this is in control. A control deck that either doesn't have to cast this on turn three or can use the ramp on the next turn in some way or another. And we have decks like that in the format right now. I'm not sure this goes directly in to Emergent Ultimatum or anything, but I do think it's interesting how many cards from Emergent Ultimatum work really well with Stadium, right? Because you play Allrin's Epiphany in that deck. That basically puts four counters on this because you tap it to play Epiphany. I would assume that puts a counter on it. You get an extra turn at, during which you will tap this card. That puts another counter on it. The two birds that you get from Epiphany will fly over and hopefully deal damage. That's two more counters. So an Epiphany just kind of by itself has the chance to put four counters on that. Add a Vorin Clex into the mix and things get insane, right? Because if you're tapping this twice over two turn cycles, that's four counters by itself. The two birds will put four counters on it with an attack step. And then Vorin Clex will hopefully trample over for some damage and put the rest of the counters on it. You can actually win the game that way in a couple of bites. So that, that doesn't seem too bad, but I don't think Yorion really has the slots for this at the moment. But I do like it in a kind of blue-green, controly, turbo fog type deck that plays cards like Alrin's Epiphany and Vorinclex. Vorinclex. So this this can you can use the ramp off of this card. And you know, you have other ways of winning the game. 
you have other ways of winning the game, but I imagine it's going to be really difficult for the opponent to do anything about a Strixhaven Stadium with a few counters on it. And then you play Allrin's Epiphany. That really threatens to win the game in a hurry. So I like a lot about this card, even if I'm not sure that it slots into anything day one. I do think there's a build out there for it. I just think it's a little more outside the box and a lot of people are evaluating it. Now, my number nine is a little uncommon that I like a lot, and that's a Damagoth Woe Eater. There's a couple of these, like, gold uncommon four drops with the hybrid mana in their, in their casting cost. There's a couple of these on the list, and for good reason. They're not all created equal. Some of them are just way better than others. And Woe Eater is one that surprises me a lot, you know. Four mana for a 7-6 body is a pretty good rate. Would imagine you know having to sacrifice a creature can easily be turned into an upside and that's where i like this card and on turns where you do have to sacrifice this for whatever reason it still gives you upside you draw a card off of it so it replaces itself i imagine a four mana seven six that replaces itself when you sack it it's <laughs> pretty good but you know your opponent also discards a card you know there's there's other effects and then you gain a couple of life so like all things considered you kind of get like a little doom foretold effect when this pops off you just don't get another body off of it but that's cool you had a body in the first place you had a seven six body to begin with so if you do have to sacrifice it not only to itself but any other effects you know i think this goes really well with like woe strider because you know, you can sacrifice this to a Woe Strider and get the, the benefit off of sacking it. So there's that. But you can also sack the goat to this at least once if the goat is still alive. These work on curve well together. And if you have to sacrifice the Woe Strider to the Demigoth, that's kind of fine too because you can just escape the Woe Strider. Get another goat, sacrifice that to the Demigoth. But when you are, you know, forced to sacrifice eventually the Demigoth to its own ability, it's actually not bad. It pays you back a little bit. And there's even going to be turns. In Constructed Magic, I imagine this will happen a lot in Limited, but even in Constructed Magic, there will be turns where you play this to stave off an attack step for a turn, right? Because your opponent's probably not going to want to swing into this. And then you also get a card, your opponent loses a card, you gain two, it doesn't feel too bad, and you kind of got to stave off your opponent's lethal for a turn in some cases. So I think there's a lot of really cool stuff about this card. I love the rate on it, and... I also love that even though there's a downside, shouldn't be too hard to turn it into an upside. And if you are able to sacrifice it either to its own ability or to another ability, crazy stuff happens, you know. And we've seen a lot of stuff that this is going to work well with in Limited that's like all uncommon. Like this is uncommon. Uh, Tin the Pest is uncommon and that'll work really well. But I'm kind of interested to see how busting into 7-1-1 tokens at each game life when they die and also gaining some life drawing a card and making your opponent discard all at the cost of just a couple of mana. I kind of want to see how that works out in standard. So, you know, there's just a lot of really cool stuff you can do with this card and the raid is very much there. Don't ignore it. It's cool. But let's move on to number eight, which is Quandrix Cultivator. I told you there'd be another one of these uncommon four-drop creatures with hybrid mana and its casting cost. It seems very specific, but they made a couple of really good ones in this set. And I think Cultivator is actually fantastic. I compare it to Solemn Simulacrum, which I think we'll probably still see more play than this will while Simulacrum's in the format. But it won't always be in the format. So there's that to think about. This doesn't draw you a card when it dies, but it is much more likely to trade with something on blocks, which is not drawing a card, but it still affects the board state. And in a lot of cases, you'll totally take that too. So, you know, doesn't draw you the card when it dies, but it's more likely to trade. I think it's actually really good for the decks that can't afford to play this card. It's also blinkable and bounceable for what that's worth. There's just a lot of cool stuff you can do with this to keep getting value off of it. And make no mistake, four mana for a 3-4 body that puts a land into play is actually just a really, really good deal in terms of just basic value. So I like this card a lot, and I don't think really anyone's talking about it. But let's get to number seven here, which is Umbral Juke. I like this card so much, and I probably shouldn't, but it, there's a lot of versatility on this. For just three mana, which can seem kind of steep, but I honestly think they could have costed this more if they wanted it to be strictly limited playable. I'm not sure what this slots into, but three mana at, and this is key, instant speed to create a body that blocks anything or a body that can get in for sufficient damage with evasion or, you know, an edict effect at instant speed that can also snatch planeswalkers. Ain't actually half bad. You know, three mana, not a terrible rate for this kind of thing, you know. For three mana, I think that things like Soul Shatter are probably better if you just want something that strictly forces your opponent to sacrifice a thing. But if you want versatility, if that's more your bag, I like this card a lot. It's an ambush blocker that can block a ton of stuff. Even if you just need a chump blocker for a turn, it does that. If your opponent has a naked board, 
Flying 2 wanted flash speed. That's not bad either. And of course, I'll say it again, the removal half, not terrible. I mean, edict effects like this usually cost 2 mana, but they also don't have a creature stapled onto them. I just, I, I really love the versatility of this, and it's, if it wasn't instant speed, I wouldn't care at all. But the fact that it is instant speed makes me really look hard at this thing. And again, I don't know where it slots into, or if a control deck really gets enough value off of the versatility inherent in this card to want to run it in any number, but it is just really interesting to see a flying body on one half and the other half is an edict effect because both of things are super desirable, especially at instant speed. I just like this card a lot. Here we are at number six, Access Tunnel, a card that I've seen like just no hype about whatsoever, and I don't get that because there's a ton of stuff you can do with this. Just in standard, you know, you run a quick uh, search of what has power three or less, and does something when it hits for combat damage. I mean, that's, that, that last bit honestly isn't even necessary, but I want to know what the best like combat damage triggers in standard are for a card like this. And there are a ton, right? You know, we got stuff like Rankle that fits the bill. Seems pretty good to guarantee you get in with a Rankle. There's also Ifrit Flame Painter, which is in Strixhaven and could be a sleeper in its own right. But if you have an access tunnel out, that card gets a whole lot better. And then there's just stuff that even if it doesn't have a combat damage trigger, you can get through for a bunch of damage. You know, imagine going ahead and telling your Kazandu Mammoth that it can it can get through if it wants to this turn. Hey, Kazandu Mammoth. I'm going to tap some mana, you go through unblocked, and then I'll drop a Fabled Passage, and suddenly, that Kazandu Mammoth is getting through for 7, and yeah, it totally does work. You can do the same thing with Brushfire Elemental and blah blah, so. There's a lot of really cool stuff about this card. Gets Sea Dasher Octopus through and draws a card, and there's a bunch of other stuff in Standard that this works really, really well with, so. I like this card a lot, even if it's a fair amount of mana, and in, like, monocolored aggro decks, it does compete a little bit with Faceless Haven for the colorless land slot. I still think this is going to find its way, as a one-of, in to a surprising amount of decks. Here we are, halfway through the list, and it's Cody, everybody. I bet you didn't expect to see Cody, because there's a fair number of people talking about this card, but none for Standard. I don't think anybody really thinks this card's going to be a thing in Standard or Historic. It's mostly just going to be a Brawl Commander that lets you play five colors, a, a Commander Commander <laughs> that lets you play five colors and build your deck in really interesting ways. You know, um, I like the, just as a deck builder, I like all the challenges this card represents. Um, however, I actually think this card is, is a lot more than meets the eye. Like Transformers, you know, I think that if you play Cody on turn three, you can actually start really doing broken stuff on turn four. Just drop a land, play any instant or sorcery that you want, as long as it's five mana or less, and it doesn't have a double color in its casting cost. But there's a, there's a lot that, that, that fits that bill. Um, and then you just get a free spell out of it. You just get a free thing out of that. And that reminds me of like Fires of Invention, you know, that level of brokenness. Now, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of bodies off of Cody because, you know, you can't play permanents, but I guess you can play instants and sorceries that create bodies. So you got that going for you. But even if it is like a very powered down Fires of Invention, the ability to just almost always assuredly, if you built your deck correctly, get two free spells, or at least one free spell um, on turn four seems crazy you know and not only can you get a free spell on turn four but you're also ramping like this is kind of a rock so long as you have a land the next turn you know drop it on turn three drop a land you ramp one you cast a five mana cost thing get a free four mana cost thing it's so good like that's it just seems really really unbelievably good to me and like not even that hard to break you know, I think a lot of people, their problem with Cody is that, like, the deck building restrictions are relatively high, but I don't actually think they are. I, re I, really, I really don't. I think this is much more than just a brawl or, you know, regular commander uh, general. I think this actually could have some chops. But in at number four, I'm going to talk about Retriever Phoenix for a minute. Now, probably my famous, my most famous hit in a sleeper video ever was Arclight Phoenix, because at the time, everyone thought the card was, like, people actively said the card was terrible. It's not that people weren't weren't talking about Phoenix. <laughs> people were saying Phoenix was just bad. Um, and Arclight Phoenix went on to be a very important card, uh, and still is in some ways. But in any case, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and, 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 you know, I'm going to try and make lightning strike twice by putting another Phoenix on the list. I don't think this one's anywhere near as good as Arclight. Not even close, right? But I do think it's better than a lot of people think that it is because it's not too hard to learn. And I think this is easily the best payoff for learning. Forget all the lessons. A lot of them are Garbo, right? Sometimes I think that rummaging, discarding a card and then drawing a card is actually going to be a really important part of learning if you have great 
graveyard synergies you're trying to you know, turn on and stuff. But honestly, I think of all the possible payoffs for learning, this is the one right here, especially considering all the good learn cards are kind of in an aggro color. All of my favorite learn cards, at least, are in red and white. So shouldn't be too hard to get a Retriever Phoenix deck going, at which point all of your cheap learn cards just say, put it on the battlefield, <laughs> put this four drop on the battlefield. And that becomes uh, both annoying uh, and hard to deal with <laughs> all at the same time. It can win you a lot of games, I imagine. You know, it looks like the Boros Learn deck, if that's what it is. Uh, and it might just be mono red aggro with the learn theme, right? You know, look at uh, Academic Dispute, for instance. That is a great take on like a class. That could be on this list, honestly, because I think it's going to see some play. Great take on a classic one red mana cantrip. You know, do a thing and draw a card. In the case of Dispute, you get to, you know, do a lot of, a couple of really cool things and effectively draw a card in learning. Well, Academic Dispute is just one red mana to do a cool thing and also bring Retriever Phoenix back from your hand. I think that cards like that that learn for very cheap might be instrumental in making the Retriever Phoenix deck a thing. Again, I don't think that it's as likely as it was with a card like Arclight, but I still think this is a card that not enough people are paying attention to because this single-handedly makes the learn mechanic at least a little bit more worth it. But top three, baby, we made it together here at number three is Callous Blood Mage. I love this card, y'all. <laughs> I love this card. And I don't really know why more people aren't talking about it. I have seen a person here or there just say they like it, but I haven't seen anybody really say it's going to see much play. And even in the, like, crafting guide, I, 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 I you know wigged out over this card for a while like oh it's gonna be so good and i love it so much but don't craft any copies of it because <laughs> i don't know where it goes and i still don't know where it goes but look at it you know i was just saying the other day that i want a phyrexian rager style effect that's all i want is a creature that draws a card when it etbs in black now we got it that's all i really wanted so i'm happy about this card but it's part phyrexian rager part the third chapter of elspeth's nightmare which is good too especially right now and part this, this guy, <laughs> Night Squad Commando, did I get that right? I think that's, I think that's correct. Part Night Squad Commando. Um, and I like that versatility, right? You can only get one of these things when it ETBs, but there's plenty of ways to blink it multiple times in a game. You get a board full of creatures or, you know, just draw a bunch of cards, which is more likely what's going to happen. So just for the Phyrexian Rager with one less toughness mode on this card, I'm a big fan of it, but slapping two other modes on it that do, you know, game state specific things, I'm a huge fan of too. Even if you just want two bodies to block with or something, this also gets that done. This just does so much that I think it'll probably do something in a real deck at some point. It'll be a real boy. And at number two, Torrent Sculptor, but that's not the card I'm actually that worried about. Let's turn it over. There it is. Flamethrower Sonata is not only, again, just maybe the best name for a magic card I've ever heard in my life, but also a pretty cool card, you know? You can't just discard a huge creature to this and get all the value off of it because you have to discard an instant or sorcery in order for it to be a removal spell. But I still think there are going to be times where you discard a big creature to it and just draw a card, right? You get like half of a Tormenting Voice or something. But all things considered, I think this is probably going to be better than Tormenting Voice 90% of the time, you know, because it can be removal, in which case it's still the same kind of card parody as a Tormenting Voice. You know, you discard a card, you draw two cards, and you spent the Tormenting Voice. You spent two cards, you draw two cards. In the case of Sonata, you spend Sonata and you discard a card. So you spend two cards. But you kill one of their guys, and you draw a card. So spend two, get two cards back. The same card parody as Tormenting Voice. But you've affected the battlefield. And I think that's much, much better uh, in, a, in a lot of cases. And if you don't have a reason to use Sonata, or you just don't have a creature to target, you're playing against control or something, the other half is a body. That's difficult for control to do much about without a sweeper, or they have to use all their mana to do something about it. So I just like this card. Again, in terms of versatility, I like it on both halves, even if both halves are slightly powered down. I think that they're far more than the sum of their parts. And even if the body on Torn Sculptor isn't super impressive, even if you get it to like a 5-5, five five, it's still just kind of vanilla aside from the ward ability, which can be annoying to deal with, but it doesn't even, like, fly or anything. <laughs> so just a vanilla body isn't amazing, even if it's relatively big. But at least it's a body when it would be an otherwise dead card. And I really, really like that about it. So I think this card has a chance to see some play during its standard tenure, even if I don't think it's going to happen immediately. I think the Sonata half is so good that eventually it will find its deck. But we made it to number one already. It seems like a quick sleepers list this time around. But number one is... 
pretty easy to me, and I think there's a pretty vast amount of separation between it and the rest of the cards on the list. Number one is Tempted by the Auric, a card that I am tempted to put on the top 20 or top 25 list, but I just, I'm not that confident in it, and it's not really seeing a whole lot of discussion right now. Um, and that's a real shame. Like, it's seeing so little discussion that I think it's worth being the number one sleeper in the set. Because, like, the card is so bonkers. Like, it's a little bit difficult to cast. And, yeah, you can't get a truly big creature with it. Or can you? You know, in this format, you can get a Lovestruck Beast and everything on down. Some of the most important creatures in the format right now are three drops. You know, you can't grab your opponent's Torbrand, but you can grab their Annex or their, you know, Ash, their Phoenix of Ash or whatever. You can grab... A fervent champion that's wearing an ember cleave. You can grab a creature wearing an ember cleave <laughs> with a tempted, which is kind of nice. Kazandu Mammoth, again, Lovestruck Beast, uh, what, Garrick's Harbinger. There's a bunch, actually. Skyclave Apparition. I mean, can we sit here and name every important two and three drop creature in the entire format? I don't think that that's a good idea, honestly. But uh, just know <laughs> there are a ton of important ones. You know, imagine how good this is against, like, the mono white deck right now because they're only real. Safeguard against this is like All Seed of Life's Bounty, but if they don't have All Seed out, you can grab their Luminarch Aspirin, you can grab their Selfless Savior or whatever, and their indestructibility is not going to save them. Did I say Selfless Savior? I meant Seasoned Hallow Blade. You grab their Seasoned Hallow Blade that's wearing a Maul of the Skyclaves. Or maybe you grab their Speaker of the Heavens that's wearing a Maul of the Skyclaves. You start swinging in with Lifelink and you'll eventually you, maybe you'll get some Angels. It's just like, I think that this is a really good card against that deck specifically, but a bunch of other creature-based decks in this format. It'll be dead some of the time against like Yorion and some other decks, so it's probably not going to see any play immediately but if aggro is a real thing and at the same time simultaneously mono blue is a real thing i think this is going to be an important card i just like it a lot more than like low mages domination for a lot of the decks that might want to play it even though domination scales a little bit better i still think four mana for a control magic that albeit conditional and a little bit tougher to cast than a traditional control magic at least isn't a thing you can break it's not an aura that you put on your opponent's creature like a control magic or in bolus's clutches or a bunch of other effects like this that your opponent then breaks and gets their guy back no you cast this it resolves you have their creature for forever and there's not much they can do about it and traditionally that's a really good on a on a on a control magic effect so i just think there's a lot to like about this card even if it's ultimately a sideboard card in one to two color decks i think it's going to be a role player at some point during its standard life cycle that's it. That's all my sleepers for Strixhaven, and I could have made this a top 20. There are a bunch of other cards that I wanted to talk about today because I'm kind of afraid that they won't be talked about ever if I don't talk about them now. But that's not really a sleeper, is it? That's just a card Dev likes. Maybe we should have three lists every preseason. You know, the sleepers, the top 25, and then like top 10 cards Dev likes. <laughs> There's a bunch that I don't think are actual sleepers, but I do think deserve a moment in the sun at some point. But just, you know, it's your turn now. Get down to the comments section. Get down there. That's English. To the comments section, the sideboard. And uh, let me know either how you felt about these takes, what cards I talked about can break through in standard, or just what cards I didn't mention. You know, anything that you think isn't really receiving much attention right now that probably should, let us know in the comments section. Aside from that, you can watch me play Magic, which we will commence doing again very soon once Strixhaven comes out. I do have a stream coming up later today as you watch this, because this will probably come out Friday morning. So Friday night around 6 we're going to be doing a stream, but it's mostly going to be uh, having fun. We're going to be having a lot of fun that stream. Uh, probably watching an old backyard wrestling match of mine from many, many years ago. So, you know, if you're if you're into that and you and you want to have some fun, <laughs> come to twitch.tv slash spmtjev. Jev. Dev. SPMTG Dev. That's what it is. Um, 6 p.m. Eastern on Friday. And we'll be getting down and having some fun in uh, in anticipation of WrestleMania weekend. But even if you don't care about wrestling, uh, which is understandable if you don't, it's pretty silly, then uh, just come by the stream and have some fun with us, talk some magic and all that stuff. But aside from that, if you want to support the channel, it's just a dollar a month to vote on what decks we do during Strixhaven Standard. And obviously our first poll of the season is going to be coming up super soon. So if you want to support the channel, a buck a month is all I ask, and I would really appreciate your support right about now. But you don't have to. If you're here, I'm glad that you're here. Your views mean a lot to me. Your watch time means a lot to me. And uh, yeah, 
yeah, I, I like you. I mean, <laughs> just just for being here, putting in that work, kid. But in any case, I guess I'm done for this one. So I'll catch you guys later. I'm Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, wizards. Spread love and be kind. <laughs>